major portion of our Bibles and the Old Testament record the words of the prophets. One of the least studied, most neglected portions of the Bible. Probably if I were to look at the spine of your Bible there, those would be the least worn pages. They are for me. Why is that? Well, they're ancient. Their structure is complicated compared to many other portions of Scripture, meaning sometimes difficult to discern, and the application not always obvious. And when you do, it's often uncomfortable. No wonder the pages are unworn. So we'll try to put a little wear and tear on those pages, at least in the beginning of Isaiah over the next few weeks. Let me begin uh, with just a brief background on this particular section, which is important if we're going to see it in all of its fullness. Uh, It is complex geopolitics. I will try to make it as simple (laughs) and as clear as I possibly can. Ahaz, the grandson of Uzziah, was on the throne of Judah in Jerusalem. Pekah, the next to the last king of Israel, was ruling on the throne of the northern kingdom in Samaria. Assyria was at this time the dominant power of the world. But owing to internal conflicts and trouble at home and poor leadership, frankly, they had been forced to limit their expansionist goals and aspirations And as a result of that, both Israel and Judah had enjoyed about a 25-year period of relative peace and growth, economic growth and prosperity, which they had mistakenly interpreted as being the result of God's favor and blessing, in spite of their great spiritual unfaithfulness. But now storm clouds were on the rise, on the horizon, Tiglath-Pileser had ascended the throne of Assyria, and under his strong leadership, Assyria was again on the move, threatening both Aram, what is for us modern-day Syria, and Israel, the northern kingdom. As a result of that, Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the king of Israel, formed an alliance with the goal of conquering Judah, in the vain hope that that would give them the additional strength that they needed to repel the power of Assyria. This was the response of Judah, verse 2. Now the house of David was told Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people, the people of Judah, were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. They were terrified. We would say in our idiom, they were shaking in their boots, literally. It was then that Ahaz made a fatal fatal decision in his mind and heart that he would respond by throwing in his lot with Assyria. He would give all of his, or the bulk of his royal treasury to Tiglath-Pileser, become a vassal to Assyria in order to have him attack Aram and Israel in the vain hope that he would spare Judah. Enter the prophet Isaiah. Verse 3, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son Shir Jeshub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, Be careful. Calm, don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Ramalia. So the the Lord through Isaiah calls the ones who were making them shake like leaves in the wind nothing but two smoldering stumps. 
Where there had once been a great bonfire, there was nothing left but two little smoking pieces, burned out, powerless, harmless. He then continued, verse 5. Aram, Ephraim, and Remalia's son have plotted your ruin. He won't even give Pekah of the dignity of repeating his name often, just refers to him as Remalia's son. Aram, Ephraim, and Remalia's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah. Let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabeel king over it. But this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Ramalia's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. God says emphatically, categorically to Ahaz and to the people of Judah, not going to happen. It's only Rezin and Pekah. What are they before the Lord, the sovereign Lord of history? They're nothing before me. Here today, gone tomorrow. And there is in that statement an implicit rebuke of the people of Judah and Ahaz. You're willing to sell your soul to Assyria out of fear of them? In the naive assumption that they will save you? <laughs> that Assyria will save you? And then he adds this important wording, again emphatically, categorically, unless you stand firm in your faith, you will not stand. This was a decision point, a defining moment, spiritually, that would be determinative, would be a determinative moment historically for the kingdom of Judah. The future of God's people would hang in the balance on that decision. Faith in God or faith in Assyria? That was the choice. With distinctly different outcomes. Standing firm in faith or not standing at all. Let me just pause there to say it is important for us to recognize just how relevant those words are. We think of them oftentimes far removed from our own circumstances and situation, but they're really not. They're really not. We too have lived through a lengthy period of relative peace and prosperity for the better part of a generation. There have been some blips along the way, but we've always had the resources to manage even the crash of 08 and 09 wasn't without pain, but we weren't devastated like in the days of the Great Depression. That ability to basically weather economic downturns and then enjoy pretty lengthy periods of economic growth and prosperity have, have bred and both bred and massed a certain degree of spiritual complacency. The assumption that because we're material, materially blessed and life is good and we're happy that we're living under God's favor and blessing. That he's somehow pleased with us, generally speaking. And of course you add to that that there are always false prophets who will tell us exactly that. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. But challenging and troubling times have come, haven't they? Change, difficulty, uncertainty, the confluence of some pretty significant forces that we still don't completely understand all of the causes and implications and results of. In many ways, we're going through a revolution. 
not unlike the Industrial Revolution, other great revolutions in history, and that's causing a certain amount of disruption and a certain amount of uncertainty that plays with people's sense of security and well-being. And then you throw into that a pandemic, a -a once-in-a-century pandemic. And suddenly things that we never assumed we would see have reared their ugly head again. I remember when gas went from 25 cents to 50 cents a gallon. Anybody remember that? And at the time I was driving a 68 Pontiac GTO that burned premium and guzzled. And so I traded my GTO for Trisha's dad's Toyota Corolla (laughs) in those days. But you never thought that we'd see those days again. Spikes, refineries, you know, going offline, time's up. But, you know, $7 a gallon, my goodness. Interest rates seemed forever low. (laughs) But suddenly high gas prices, inflation, high interest rates, crime, political violence like we've not seen in a in a very long time. And on top of that, a whole host of enemies that we're told are out to, to get us. Woke, whatever that is, exactly. Liberals, Black Lives Matter, critical race theory, social media, immigration, the messages that they're coming for you and for what's yours. And like Ahaz and his people, our hearts are shaken, like aspen leaves in the wind, we're quaking. And in response, we've thrown in our lot with the other side. That's our Assyria. In the vain hope that they can save us. Let me uh, just remind you of another notable example of that, exactly. So that we're not just talking about Ahaz and Judah in the time of Pekah and Aaron. The German church believed with all of its heart that it was going to find its way by throwing in its lot with the Third Reich. Believed with all their heart. That in the midst of all of those challenges and struggles that they saw as enemies, not only to their country, but to their faith, which permeated the the culture. Except for a very small remnant, led by Dietrich Bonhoeffer in particular, few others, who prophetically stood against that and warned them not to do so. In fact, their words were not much different than the words that God spoke through Isaiah here. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. The Barnum Declaration, the Barman Declaration, excuse me, which was the proclamation that they courageously made, the confessing church in Germany, this small little remnant, was was exactly that. And it was that warning. Bonhoeffer, who prophetically stood against that and warned them not to do so, met the fate of many a prophet. But like the repeated line of the prophets, they wouldn't listen. John Oswald, in his wonderful two-volume commentary on Isaiah, writes these words. Let me read them for you. From Isaiah's point of view, Judah should have neither been anti-Syrian. Let me read that again. From Isaiah's point of view, Judah should have been neither anti-Syrian nor pro-Assyrian, but pro-God. Pro-God. He saw Judah turning away from trusting God and becoming caught up in the trappings of human pomp, politics, and power. And that would lead to the same downfall as Israel 
end of quote. Now, as if these categorical statements were not enough for Ahaz, God added another assurance, a personal invitation. Verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. If my words are not enough for you, if my assurance that it won't happen, if my reminder of who are Rezin and who are Pika are not enough, then ask me for a sign. Anything. Anything on earth and in heaven or below. Any, you ask me, whatever it is, carte blanche, ask me for the sign. God's condescension to us extends to his willingness to accommodate our human frailty. He's not put off by that. To assure our faith. To give us, as it were, a pledge of his faithfulness and power. Like Gideon, who wanted to believe, but needed that extra assurance. And so says to God, I will... You know, forgive me for this, but I'll, I'll place out this fleece. And you allow the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. And then I'll know that you're with us. And God says, no problem. I can do that. It's easy. Easy money. So Gideon gets up the next morning and not only is the fleece wet, it's so wet that he can wring out a full bucket of water out of it. God wanted to make sure he gave him the sign. And then, of course, Gideon says, well, you know, Lord, thank you, but how about dry fleece, wet ground? <laughs> I says, I can do that. No problem. So the next morning he gets up, and there, sure enough, the fleece is dry, and the ground is saturated around it. God doesn't, God doesn't put off by that if our hearts are sincere. God says to Ahaz, ask me anything, anything you will. And here was Ahaz's response, verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. That sounds so spiritual. Scriptural, even. There was only one problem. It was God himself who was giving him the invitation, and Ahaz was contradicting no one less than God himself, which elicited this well-deserved rebuke from Isaiah in verse 13. Isaiah said, Here now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of God also? Why did Ahaz refuse the sign? Have you thought about that? Because he didn't want the sign, because he'd already made his decision. You know how we are? The heart decides and then it asks the head for reasons. And we don't want any reasons that will contradict our heart. He'd already decided. Assyria was their answer. He was, he was convinced. But here's what's important to understand what was behind that in terms of Ahaz and the people of Judah. They had long ago quit believing and trusting. Long ago. Oh, they professed faith adamantly. Their lives were filled with religious activity. But their lives were anything but genuine lives of faith and devotion and trust. Three things characterized Israel and later Judah. I'll just summarize these three primary things, threads that run through all of the prophets, both the major magisterial prophets and the minor prophets as well. 
Number one, profound spiritual infidelity. That's spoken and described and pictured in all kinds of ways in the prophets to try to help the people of Israel understand exactly the truth of their situation in regard to their relationship to God. God was no longer their one and only. They were to rise every morning and to say to themselves, the Lord your God is one. That didn't mean simply that he was mono. That was not simply a declaration of monotheism. The great Shema, the Lord your God is one. It meant the Lord your God is one and one only. There is no other. That's why it immediately goes on to say, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your strength. The operative word being what? All. There are no gradations of fidelity. Fidelity either exists or it does not exist. He is either your one and all or he is not your one and all. And of course the great spiritual lie is that he can be important to me but not me, my one and all. And the reality is that he will either be your one and all or he will be nothing to you. They had drunk from the well of wealth and power as God had warned them through Moses before their entrance into the promised land. Be careful that when I give you all of these things that your hearts do not turn away from me and you become proud and you become preoccupied with the things that I've given, the gifts rather than the giver. Repeatedly had warned them. But they had drunk from the well of the good life of wine and food and drink and pleasure and entertainment. And their hearts had grown remote. They'd become arrogant, proud, greedy, selfish, self-centered. Which led to the second thread that runs through the prophets. Unrighteousness slash justice. Righteousness, by its most basic definition, means doing right by others. Giving them their due. So if I have two shirts and somebody has none, the righteous thing is to give one of those shirts to the person who has none. I'm doing right by them. If I have two and I hoard my two shirts, why they have none, I've not done right by them. That's righteousness. And so Job in his declaration of innocence before God can declare, I have done right by the poor. And he enumerates in detail how he had lived righteously. And a lack of, righteous, lack of righteousness, a lack of doing right, is injustice. And the prophets wail at the prevalence of injustice in the nation of Israel and Judah. Neglect and exploitation of the most powerless, helpless, and vulnerable. The widow, the orphan, and the alien. Which brings to the third thread, all cloaked in an abundance of religious activity that had very little spiritual impact on them personally or on others around them. Profound infidelity, profound unrighteousness and injustice, cloaked in religious activity. You can go to you don't have to read very far into any of the prophets to come to those, those threads. But let me just show you in the opening of Isaiah, if you turn to chapter 1, let me just show you a couple of places because it, it's, it's, it's there throughout. But it's there in the introduction. Hear this, verses 2 through 4 of chapter 1. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its 
owner's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. That's infidelity. Verse 16. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right or righteousness. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Verse 21. See how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She was once full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, partner with thieves. They all love bribes. They all chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. They're not out to use their position to serve the vulnerable. They're out for themselves. (laughs) And then get this, verse 10. All cloaked in this, hear the word of the Lord. You rulers of Sodom, listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. He's speaking to Israel and Judah there. Don't don't be mistaken. The multitude of your sacrifices, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord, I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feast, your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Because they were trusting in human wealth and power, they trusted in human saviors. It was as simple as that. If you're trusting in wealth and power, you don't turn to the Lord of history, the sovereign Lord of history, for your help. You turn to those who will be the savior for the things that you want saved. Which brings us to the sign, verse 14. Here now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you also try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And we'll call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. God says, you don't want a sign? I'll give you a sign. That's what he did. Behind your facade of piety, I'll give you a sign. A virgin birth. Fully human. Young maiden. 
virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. But she shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Fully divine, fully human, fully divine. Who will know the difference between right and wrong before he does right or wrong. Sinlessly perfect. Fully human, fully divine, without sin, who will be the savior of the world. How's that for a sign? What more do you need than that? (laughs) Unfortunately, Ahaz was not interested. Decision had already been made. Wasn't impressed by the prophecy. You can read all about it (laughs) if you want to read more in 2 Kings chapter 16. He gave the treasury or the bulk of the treasury to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, pledging Judah as a vassal to his kingdom. Assyria in turn conquered Damascus and Samaria, which they would have done anyway, by the way. They didn't need the treasury of Judah to do that. They were already on the march. Israel fell and was exiled. But it also set in motion a series of events that would eventually culminate in the fall of Jerusalem, all previewed in verses 18 through 25 that we didn't read. You can read about it there. Because the decision was already made, God said this is already what will be and shows them the devastation that awaits them. They did not stand. So, and without, I, and I, I, uh, I don't want to in any way sound hyperbolic, and I've thought and prayed about this much, which... <laughs> doesn't mean that you shouldn't pray about it and think about it for yourself as well. But this is what I want to say. We're engaged in a significant struggle. But it is not with resin and pica. It's a struggle for faith. Whether we're going to trust in Assyria or whether we're going to trust, trust in the sovereign Lord who reigns. And that's going to determine whether we stand or do not. What for Ahaz was a prophecy for us is fulfillment. What he saw only by way of a prophet's glimpse, though remarkable, we have in full view. If the glimpse should have been enough for him, how much the full view for us? The Son of God became man, God with us, and offered his sinless life for us. The Savior of the world has come, King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you know that, um, that um, the way that you um, articulate a superlative in Hebrew is by the repetition? <laughs> King of kings. Lord of lords. Vanity of vanities. Meaningless of meaningless. Song of songs. This is a song. <laughs> That's how you articulate the superlative king of kings lord of lords the son of god became man god with us and offered his sinless life on our behalf the savior of the world has come and he reigns he reigns eternal and we're all uptight and wrapped around the axle that's a 
that's a mil that's an army term, isn't it, Todd? Wrapped around the axle. We're all leaves quaking in the wind. <laughs> About what? Liberals? Really? <laughs> Media? We're shaking and quaking over that? Those are resin and pica. That's all they are. God says, God says the, for the head of Aram is Damascus. The head of Damascus is only resin. Smoldering stumps. That's all they are. They powerful, they're powerful. They influential, they're influential. Are there legitimate concerns about the power and influence and the governance and the laws that govern their ability to do what they do? Not denying any of that. But are they worth quaking over? What are they compared to him? They're not worthy to determine our lives or our actions or our direction. And we're going to trust in who? The other side? Assyria? Really? That has never stood and never will. It has never stood and it never will. If you go back and look at church history for the last 2,000 years, every time the church has crawled into bed with the powers that be, the church has not stood. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. So how about this Advent season we allow ourselves to affirm this sign, this one, this son, this king, this Lord, and to renew our confidence and faith in him and him alone. I think that's a worthy reflection for Advent. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Let's pray together. I want to just invite you to take just a few moments to allow the Lord any thing that he would want to put his finger on in your heart or life or say to you in these moments of quiet. And then for a moment to just thank him for who he is relative to everything else that is. And then finally, just to remind ourselves that there is nothing, nothing in all of the earth nothing in all of the universe that is worthy of our love and our devotion and our commitment and our trust and our service than him. Lord, we uh, face these decisions every day of our lives, about what's going to occupy our time, 
What's going to occupy our hearts? What's going to occupy our minds? What we're going to think about? What we're going to be concerned about? What we're going to be concerned for? And so we pray today and in these weeks and then in the weeks that follow that you might renew our minds and hearts to love you as you ought to be loved with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And then out of that to live our days with all of our strength for you, for your purposes and for your kingdom, we pray. Help us to do that. We thank you for your condescension and your willingness to meet us where we are, to encourage us and lift us up when we're doubtful or struggling. You're not put off by that. But Lord, may that never be a substitute or an excuse for us not doing the business that we need to do with you about the place of our devotion and our affection. I pray. Thank you. Meet us now as we come to you. Feed us, I pray. Through your glorious life given to us through your sacrificial death, O Lord. Would you meet us now, we pray in Jesus' name.